We are going to move on to, uh, no exaggeration, one of my favorite people in space. Uh, I have known Laird David for, uh, for, for 20 years. Uh, that's hard to imagine, but uh, uh, he is the third person I met in my space journey. So uh, I've had a lot of admiration for him for a long time. Um, Leonard is a, uh, and I'm doing this by memory because I don't actually have notes on him. I just know him well enough. I'm just going to wing it. Uh, Leonard is a, a many, many times published author. He has been writing for uh, space.com basically for two decades, but, but he's been doing writing in space for four decades. Uh, recently, I think just last week, he got his uh, Mars book that was um, part of the National Geographic series, got translated into, was it Chinese or, uh, yeah, okay, so that's good for you. Um, and then uh, he's going to be talking a bit about his uh, book, uh, The Moon Rush. So take it away, Leonard. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be with uh, like-minded people. Uh, I live up here in Colorado, about 9,000 feet, and sometimes it's not like-minded, but uh, uh, we're closer to the moon than, than normal. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I didn't prepare any slides. Barbara yelled at me to prepare PowerPoints and I'm going, I'm just gonna, this is my book. It's a moving PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> I survived this book uh, for National Geographic. You know, it was in the middle of all the books that were coming out on the 50th anniversary of the Apollo uh, program. And, and my going in philosophy on that, this book was, I told National Geographic, I did not want to write about Apollo. I wanted to write about the future. Wh where did Apollo leave us? Uh, in the dust, uh, literally in 72, when Jack Schmidt uh, and, and Gene Cernan left uh, the moon, wh wh where do we go from here? And so I tried to do that. I, I went through three editors, so I, I'm still shaking. Uh, it was a... <laughs> It was a pretty uh, monumental task trying to finish this thing. And at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's there, it's good. It, I think it does make some points that I, I was really pleased to see uh, maintained in the book because uh, I, I'm gonna go into the format of the book, which is, you know, I think we're in a space race. You know, this is something very similar to what I grew up uh, with the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, vying, putting cosmonauts or astronauts on the moon. And it, it's a different situation. It's Maybe it's not a Sputnik event, but I, I do sense something uh, on the ominous side. I mean, if you're a political whiz kid, I'm not probably one of them, but I think the idea of other countries now getting involved uh, is really, one, it's exciting, it's diplomatic. It's also going to uh, gnarl the U.S. political system. Uh, so I think we've got some real uh, comeuppance coming, uh, particularly with China. Uh, you know, I think this new relationship with, uh, with Russia uh, on establishing a lunar uh, encampment uh, at the South Pole uh, is pretty interesting. and. Uh, you know, Russia probably needs China more than China needs Russia. We'll see. But it's going to be interesting to see what the dynamics of that are going to be. Don't forget that Russia is going to come back with a vengeance in, in lunar exploration, uh, maybe uh, October or November of this year with Luna 25. This would be their first robotic uh, uh, lunar mission since 76, something in there when they were returning samples from the moon. So uh, we'll see how well the Russian system does on an engineering-wise. Lobotkin, we have some players that have traditionally been engaged in all the history of the Russian space program. We'll see how well they do. A lot of those people are dead. 
uh, a lot of new younger people are coming into the Vogue. Uh, and we'll see how well they pull this off. So uh, that's always one wild card that's uh, still to come. Um, you know, beyond that, I, I think, you know, uh, I'm excited to think about, you know, Bill Nelson and the new NASA, and we'll see how new it is. Got a new administrator and uh, he's fighting the political uh, winds and trying to get uh, uh, a policy and finances to move forward on the U.S. lunar program. Um, I'm not quite sure how it's all going to play out because I've been here too many times with too many presidents and too many uh, social issues and too many administrators. Uh, you're never quite sure how it's all going to glue together. However, I would say that this Chinese, Russian, and other countries coming along in space exploration has got to play something on the hill, Capitol Hill. Got to have some import. Are we going to be left, you know, uh, talking about Apollo for the rest of our lives? Or are we going to try to move on? And um, I, I was listening to your last speaker, and one thing that Michael, I don't know if you agree with this, but to me, the community of the lunar uh, uh, groups is huge. I mean, I'm, I'm going through a lot of emails and a lot of websites, uh, and they go from, you know, philosophical kind of, you know, rhetoric to technical, you know, how to beat the dust on the moon. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a huge sweep of groups now that are very interested in this. Uh, the more I think your group can coalesce with some of those and try to uh, appreciate their uh, studies that they're doing, um, the better. Because, uh, particularly one of them is Applied Physics Lab. They have a whole lunar group now that has just subdivided into all this minutia of detail from power systems to lunar dust to you know, you know where the ice is to whatever it is, and and uh, that that is pretty impressive. I mean, there's some really thinkathon things going on now, and uh, so we, you know, everybody will benefit by coalescing these these groups that are coming up with a lot of different kind of ideas. And you know, you know, I'm getting old. You know, it's just like I, I reminiscing about 40, 50 years of space journalism and, and living through the Apollo uh, program, I still have in my mind, I walked into the bar that I was working at and I, I argued with the bartender, can you turn on the moon landing? Right. It was probably Apollo 14 or 15 or something. He go, we're going to the moon again? <laughs> <laughs> almost had a fist fight in there. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it is going to be interesting to see, you know, repetition of, uh, of lunar landings and what's going to, you know, how the public will uh, assimilate all that. Um, but that was a, one of my key memories is, uh, is somebody tired of the moon already, uh, you know, and, and just didn't see the value of the whole thing. And uh, one of the things I really did try to push in, in Moonrush, my book, that we don't know this place very well. Uh, you know, we, there's just definitely some surprises coming and you can see it coming in the literature. Uh, I just read some Chinese paper this morning uh, from uh, China, Shangi 5, uh, some of their data in Shangi 4. And, you know, there's definitely some very interesting scientific uh, data coming from these, these craft. Um, they're still being assessed and weighed. So uh, my guess is we got really a lot of surprises. And how are we going to uh, best uh, characterize the ice. I, I, I'm a little tired of people already claiming billions of dollars on manufacturing ice and processing. And uh, as far as I know, and I've talked to quite a few people and putting this book together, uh, 
we're not quite sure what we're going to deal with in those shun, those those craters that are, have no sun going on. Uh, you know, Leslie Gertz, uh, you know, I, I live here in Colorado, so I go to, over to the School of Mines every time they have their, their lunar meeting and mining uh, meeting. And, you know, uh, you can, uh, the whole appreciation of what we're going to find in those sunshine craters, we're not, we don't know. How much money is that going to take? We don't know. What's processing? What are we talking about? Is that real? Uh, we got to, and we've got a, a bunch of small uh, spacecraft that will uh, help us uh, sort that out. Um, I, um, I always lean on the pessimistic side and, and willing to always be wrong. But I, my guess is we're going to find a lot of odd things in, in these craters. And at, initially, I think there's some science data that's going to be uh, uh, accumulated in those craters that we probably want to assay first science and then think about mining that and using that resource up. So uh, some of it's gonna be uh, life uh, signals about life, organic materials. I don't know what it's gonna be, who knows? And that's why we're gonna go. So um, I don't know, beyond that, I, I'm, uh, you know, we, the thing about the, the moon now, and when you think about it, um, I wish I was 12 again. <laughs> we all do. Yeah, uh, because when I first started ripping out articles in a magazine called Aviation Week, they didn't even have space technology attached to it. Uh, and watching the whole NASA program build on this Mercury, Gemini, Apollo step-by-step realm or you know things that we pulled off there as milestones um you know it i i feel like we're there again you know i, I I'm, I'm a kid on this internet i'm having a blast <laughs> there's so much going on we got branson and bezos taking off you know i mean there's so many things that your email is just stuffed with excitement and um and every probably since we started talking, ten new sp new start space companies probably got going. <laughs> so that's always a fun thing, and everybody's got a great idea, and uh, not everybody's going to succeed. But we certainly are seeing something we've never seen before. Uh, even back when I was twelve or thirteen, you know, looking at the, you know, I grew up in San Diego, and and I lived in San Diego in a, a little enclave there that had general dynamics, astronautics, engineers. And I mean, watching these guys and talking to them in the neighborhood when you're a kid, things were blowing up, things were not going well. Kennedy was talking, we gotta get to the moon and you know, things were just going awry. <laughs> And, you know, we, they pulled off all these incredible uh, achievements over the decades. And uh, uh, watching these younger entrepreneurial companies and, you know, even uh, certainly uh, Elon Musk is, and, and Jeff Bezos. I mean, these are, uh, and Branson, uh, incredible entrepreneurs with money, deep pockets. Um, so that's a great signal about what's coming uh, now. When I flip to the pessimistic side, I do think we're going to see loss of life. I, I, I think we're going to have uh, tragedies. I, I, the, the chances are high that we'll have some slip up here. And uh, I don't know how the public takes it. I don't know how the companies will take it. Virgin Galactic, with their crash of their spaceship uh, design, uh, certainly got way behind schedule because of that uh, accident that killed one of the pilots. So uh, I do worry about all that. I mean, we, we're definitely taking risks here. Uh, I'm not, but you know, the people putting their money in there, uh, you know, if we have some kind of mishap on, on Branson's or Bezos or both or whatever, uh, that certainly will reflect on, on the space program in large. Um, 
uh, Orion, you know, there are people here probably that hate the uh, space launch system, you know, but that's going to fly and we'll see if that succeeds. Uh, but it's so you take all that in and you're just like, oh, this is kind of cool. It's a lot going on here. <laughs> you know, so uh, again, I guess just a shut up a bit. Uh, the, the story to me is China. Um, I, I, I really watch China a lot. I think this uh, space station construction site activity is pretty fundamental for uh, diplomacy as well as technical uh, engineering for, for that country. And uh, they're gonna build on that. And, and the fact that they landed on Mars the first time out with a, uh, I just posted some new photos from the, the rover this morning. That was pretty, uh, pretty major achievement. Uh, for them to pull that off one first time out. So uh, they're, they're the wild card in, in, in politically uh, how that reflects on the US Congress and what we do about it. Uh, I'm all for, I'm just writing a new story for Scientific American on uh, space cooperation and what, you know, is it a good thing, bad thing? What, you know, are we going to be left behind at the launch pad or what's going to happen? Um, how do we work with other nations uh, beyond the allies that we've uh, utilized and been with for the many decades now? So um, let's say beyond that, I did have a thing I came up, I woke up thinking this is awful. <laughs> I, I did have a thing, I, I put it down on paper and it sort of reads okay. I, I don't want us to become the space flailing civilization. Flail, space flailing, you know, and you know, we have in the US, we have a good slogan going now with space, uh, constancy of purpose. Okay, uh, it, it can also be constipation of purpose. We're not careful. Uh, and again, I've gone through a lot of presidents, a lot of space policy whiz kids, uh, and th this can go awry. And we'll see how this, the space program, as, as NASA puts it forward, as, as uh, you know, the government activity uh, puts it forward, uh, you know, it can go awry. So we'll see. And I think the encouraging thing is all this private sector uh, space activity, tremendous capability now and uh, NASA has, has taken advantage of that through a lot of public private partnerships uh, to their credit. And so let's hope that we have a, a vibrant uh, space agenda that leads us back to the moon. And again, the, the corny line is this time to stay and sustain. And uh, let's, let's see where we are. That's pretty much it, I think, Mike. Okay, well, I'm not going to let you off the hook just yet. So, oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, talk about the process of creating the book. What were the surprises that you had when it was about three years ago, right? Do I have my timing right? Yeah, it, a couple of years or so. I, I, I worked so hard on this thing and it just almost killed me. But it was, I think the surprises were how surprising I was that we didn't know as much about the moon as w that you'd think we would after spending 25 billion to send 12 people that will walk around and grab samples. And, and uh, the other surprise kind of, and it's still there. Where did the moon come from? <laughs> what is it? You know, I went and talked to a bunch of people. I got more confused than I've ever been about trying to write that section about formation of the moon. Okay. You know, it was accumulated, it came out of the earth, you know. There's a bunch, there's still this, Robin Knapp at the Southwest Research Institute is one of the top gurus on this issue. And, and you know, it's a head scratcher. <laughs> and yeah. if we would know the basics of the formation of the moon and why it's there and and what role it played, uh, you know, in, in early, uh, even the early Earth. So that was surprising. The other thing that was surprising was um, 
the uh, I think when you I try to be honest and say, look, not there are friends of the moon coming. You you will have groups that it's you're taking our poetic license away. Uh, the moon is so uh, part of our culture, and to trample on it and to have lunar mining sites everywhere and, yep. and we're going to be looking at you know, craters with lights in there and you know it'll be a different kind of moon that we'll see so i i did try to put those people in there to make sure that i didn't leave them out <laughs> so i'm going to i'm going to steal a little bit of your time and tell you a story um i was out in amsterdam about 10 years ago giving a lecture and uh, I'm all excited, right? I'm a, I'm a lunatic. I'm trying to build an elevator on the moon. And this woman gets up and, you know, she stands up and she's like, got her finger and she's pointing like this. And she's like, how dare you talk about strip mining the moon? How dare you talk about strip mining my moon? And she was yeah. very emotional about it. And I, she caught me off guard because I don't, I don't encounter, I don't encounter people like that. I don't encounter people that are anti developing the moon very often. Um, and so, you know, I gave her my answer and then afterwards, she didn't like my answer, uh, but you know, I gave her my answer. And then afterwards I specifically reached out to her and we had like a 45 minute conversation. And I'll tell you, honestly, she changed my mind with just one or two sentences. She said, the moon is the only thing that binds all of humanity, right? You, you can't, you don't have a romantic relationship with the sun. It will blind you. The <laughs> only thing that all humans have who have ever lived has in common is the moon. And that, that actually really kind of changed how I approached some of my conversations. So yeah. it's definitely there. Definitely. Yeah, right. no, they're there. And it's, it is interesting. And, and, you know, and then on the other hand, I try to balance that chapter out with, uh, I kind of felt, I'm not, I'm not a great historian, but I do like the, I think we're in now history. You know, frankly, this is today. Yeah. But I, I did go back and look at Seward's Folly and buying Alaska. And I think we got, there's some things that resonate with me when I read the history of buying uh, Alaska. And it, it's a little kind of in the vogue of the moon is this wilderness site. We don't know what the value is going to be. Right. We're not sure. Uh, it, 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 uh, I'm convinced that it's going to surprise us right and left. Yep. Uh, there are resources there. There are scientific benefits of going. Uh, unbelievable uh, capability. Uh, yeah, okay, we might be doing ISRU and making fuel and oxygen and water and rocket propellant, whatever. Um, so I, I think we're going to learn a lot, but we've got to get there and start working it. Well, you you uh, heard I don't know how many papers I've accumulated on, you know, processing of lunar soil and all this stuff. I, my guess is you, we're not going to know much until we really put the hardware down and find out that that crank does not crank. <laughs> you know. <laughs> it well, just it's cold. <laughs> you you've heard uh, you've heard Clive Neal, the professor at Notre Dame talk about we have a sample size of one right? We have N of one. We know where there's maybe some water in one place. And so everybody's betting these multi-billion dollar fortunes on a sample size of one. So I, you know, I believe, I don't have evidence, but I believe there's more water there. Uh, I think we will find evidence if we start sending stuff, but we have to actually send the Dern rovers and get more than the sample size of one. Yeah. So when you were doing your research, uh, were there any organizations that, that um, you know, that you were, when you were writing, you're like, oh, these are groups to watch, or this is a person to watch, or this is an organization, or this is a capability. What should we be watching now 
from your kind of inside baseball perspective? Uh, there were a lot of people I talked to. I mean, it was just a lot. I, I'd say Ian Crawford in England is one of the, my favorites. I mean, he's very thoughtful, good research. Uh, Clive Neal, definitely the Lee Ag group, clearly, you know, assembling uh, quite a bit of information um, and data. Uh, Jim Head, Brown University, uh, Carly Peters. I mean, I really did try to talk to a lot of people. Um, and I, I'd say the, uh, there wasn't anything that really was like the, well, and the Lunar Planetary Institute, uh, they have a tremendous uh, information base there. Uh, just great. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it, and, you know, probably the one, because uh, I asked him to do the kind of outward message uh, with Jack Schmidt, Apollo 17 astronaut. I asked him to put together something for me and, uh, and Buzz wrote the forward. And, uh, and I felt kind of good. I, I had the first, you know, mission to the moon, with Buzz represented, and I had the last one in the last part of the book with Jack Schmidt. So I thought I closed it up pretty good. <laughs> That's a good yeah, yeah. You know, and, and Jack is much more politically savvy because he ran, he was senator. Uh, he's got a lot of interesting perspectives about uh, America and independence and, you know, some flag waving going on there. But I thought, well, okay, you know, this is uh, his opinion. Yeah, but he went to the moon. You know, I, you know, when you talk to people that went to the moon, it's different than people that are thinking about the moon. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, and Jack is continuing to write these great uh, essays about his time on the moon. And uh, I don't know if uh, you guys have linked up to that one, but that's, he has a diary of the last man uh, on the moon or whatever he called it. I can't remember the title of the whole thing, but it's really... He's trying to retrace his steps and things that he couldn't do, didn't have time to do, wish he could have done, what he really succeeded and was very pleased with. It's all there. And it's just, you know, he really puts you into his moon boots and you kind of walk around with him. It's a great uh, wow. contribution. I've never read it. That sounds, yeah, great. that sounds interesting. I'll send you the link and maybe you guys can yeah. tap yeah. into it. It's, it's, it's a little... Uh, well, the guy that's put, well, I'll send you the link, but it's, it's, it's really well done. And it's just a uh, unbelievable account of his uh, being a geologist. And uh, I think one of the most fun things, I'm going to shut up. One of the most fun things I did in the last decade or so, I went with Jack Schmidt and a bunch of other lunar scientists and we went to New Mexico and we walked through the training area that he trained in. Wow. And I tell you, it was pretty, pretty neat. Uh, he explained, you know, trying to teach the other Apollo astronauts what to look for that weren't, you know, they weren't geologists, but, right. you know, he was, he was trying to uh, be their kind of a tutorial guy. And uh, it was really uh, great at the Rio Grande, uh, area there where they they uh, uh where he and cernan and everybody else uh, walked through those areas trying to understand more about lunar geology so it was that was really fascinating beyond that i think we, I, good luck on the all the things you're doing and i hope uh and i did put you know i in my moon book we got the lunar elevator in there <laughs> Thanks. Glad, like I, glad I, told, I told National Geographic, I, yep. I don't want to do Apollo over and over again. Let's do the, let's go where we're going to go. So I'm hoping, uh, and boy, there's more people looking at that uh, elevator and, uh, you know, and, and seeing that as a viable uh, concept for, for the lunar surface. And uh, still got a ways to go for Earth. Sure, <laughs> sure. I, I, I certainly appreciate the plug. This was not a paid endorsement, but I'm yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me before you go. I want to ask uh, Professor um, 
Uh, Professor Thangvalu asked a question. I just want to like shout it out to you. Do you think activities in the fragile lunar surface environment without messing it all up as we do here on Earth in a pristine vacuum and low gravity environment will make us a more refined species? Will we do better? If we learn how to treat the moon well, will we do better here on Earth? I think that's a, an interesting philosophical question. Yeah. Let me go get my white robe. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, yeah, I would hope, but I I've, I've been fooled before. Uh, you know, I always I, I I used to tout something Margaret Mead talked about anthropologist about space and uh, how it would help kind of galvanize thinking and philosophy and I don't I don't know I, I'm cynical on that. I, I, I think it's fine. I, I, I hope we have an ethos that comes out of the lunar exploration that's, that has some practicality for down here. I'm not counting on it. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, frankly, I'm, and I'm, maybe I'll stir up stuff for people to talk about later, but I'm a little concerned on these Artemis Accords. Yeah. Uh, I, I think this is a, this is a little bit uh, strangeness uh, and it has all tied to the outer space treaty somehow and I, I get all these emails from people that hate the outer space treaty <laughs> let's rewrite it well it's fine the way it is um, so there's something is in there that's worrisome for people Artemis Accords uh, the fact that the, the guy championed that is, is now out of NASA Mike uh, Michael uh, gold. Uh, he's he's gold, no longer yeah. with NASA. Uh, it's bouncing around the State Department and all this. And so I, I, I don't think we've settled on what, what that is. And the other one that's weird, the other one that's weird, I'm, I'm really interested in what the military sees in cislunar space. Uh, you, you, this is a growth pattern. And we've talked about this. Yeah. Uh, you know, DARPA has something that they call Nomad or whatever it was, I'm not even sure if it's still going, but it's definitely using the lunar resources to build uh, military infrastructure. And so, okay, you put that against the Artemis Accords and, you know, you, 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 I, I see rubbing of hulls in the ocean. This is not quite what I envision as peaceful uses of outer space, you know, but you get all the the military guys you know, who I talk to quite a bit, mm -hmm. you know, other countries are going to be out there. We got to be ready. Uh, okay. So uh, we're seeing, we're seeing the beginning of the same rigmarole uh, of air, land, sea, polar, uh, military uh, conflict on earth. And this gets back to Margaret Mead, you know, like we're going to somehow, it's all going to congeal into a peaceful, harmonious uh, thing. So I, it looks to me like we're seeing uh, vibrations of military uh, superiority with whatever country you're talking about, yeah. extending out into outer space. And so it's just a, that's going to be a continuum of, of, of paranoia. And um, well, that's, definitely, that's definitely come back. And, Definitely come back and join us tomorrow because Major McLean is an active duty U.S. Space Force mm -hmm. officer, and he's going to kind of walk through how we got here and maybe what's coming next. So definitely yeah. join us tomorrow. It'll be interesting. I'll try to do that. All right. Land, uh, always terrific hanging out with you. I wish we could go okay. grab a glass of wine right now. We've yeah. earned it. Um, Let's move on to our next speaker, but uh, thanks so much. It's really great having your uh, your experience and wisdom to kind of point us. Uh, I probably should stay on here and make sure nobody really hates me. That's all. They don't hate you. We all <laughs> we all adore you. We do. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Larry. Bye bye.